Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are joined this week by an old friend of the pod, a 29-year-old I am, the founding sensei of the Chess Dojo, a YouTube creator, a book author, now a chessable author of Endgame Studies 101, but I think most of all, beloved chess trainer. He gives a lot online, uh, both on his own YouTube channel and, of course, uh, in his work with Chess Dojo, which is a multi-pronged educational platform that does Twitch streaming, YouTube videos, has an active Discord server, and helps a lot of people working on their games. So always good to catch up with our guest. I am Kostya Kovutsky. Kostya, how are you? Doing great, Ben. Thank you very much for, for having me. Always, always great to be here. Yeah, man. It's been, a, we've been doing this for five years now. Amazing. It's uh it's uh fun to, uh, to watch our uh, my chest may not progress, but everything else progress. And uh, yeah, always good to catch up. Um, so Kostya, I've mentioned in prior interviews, I'm always a big fan of your video recaps. You've been doing them for many years. Um, and you're fresh from the North American Open, where people can find your your game by game postmortems on your YouTube channel. So because of that, I don't think we need to rehash game by game too much. But I did think maybe what you talk about in the end of your last video, where you have some sort of big picture reflections on your own game, um, which I think might also be relatable for some people. So as you uh, greet in a new year and reflect on this tournament, Kostya, what what do you uh, what do you conclude? Yeah, I think the the big takeaway was that. Um, I just got to be more solid against lower rated players. Like I, I played three tournaments last year, all in Vegas. There were all these like open tournaments. And uh, in each one of the events, I ended up losing one game to like, like much lower rated player, like 200, 300 points. Definitely. I think in all three cases, they were like pretty underrated. Um, but still like two of those games were white and like almost every time and it ended up like ruining the the tournament for me. Because uh, if you lose a game to a lower rated player, especially like early on, it just kind of kills any kind of norm chances you have and, and generally kills your performance in general. Um, but uh, I'm going to be playing, I think, a lot more in 2022. And uh, I also just feel like, as usual, I can work on pretty much every single part of my game. Like, I feel like there's room to improve in calculation, openings, understanding, end games, like... Yeah, honestly, it feels like there's no limit to the amount of work I, I could be doing. Yeah, well, I mean, for a strong player like yourself to say that, I mean, I I get it, first of all, but I think everyone feels that way, probably even to a more exaggerated sense than you, because I obviously I always learn something watching your videos. And I was struck by what you I was impressed, I should say. I mean, we all have good tournaments. We all have bad tournaments. I know you weren't pleased with your last round result uh, where you, as you say, you lost to strong young player, up and coming player um, that, that played well, but I was impressed that you didn't really take a victim's mentality. Like here you kind of, you mentioned offhandly that maybe they were underrated, but I think with what's going on in tournaments right now, in terms of, uh, as has been discussed, I'm sure on Dojo and here on the podcast with like ratings kind of catching up to the pandemic and, uh, kids having a hard time, like having kids generally, if they're improving quickly, their ratings may have a hard time keeping up. But anyway, I'm I'm impressed that you're not uh, just blaming kids being underrated and you're still taking responsibility. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I always just try to focus on like the specific moves that I made and like mistakes that I made. I made like so many very clear mistakes uh, in, in the tournament. I think I actually played pretty well throughout, except for this like kind of final game where I blew it. But um, yeah, I think like when you're making obvious mistakes yourself, there's it doesn't really make sense to like blame a lot of the external factors. Like it just seems like there's a lot I could work on before I, I, I look at the system or anything like that. Yeah, that that does make sense. And you concluded at the end of your last recap and you just mentioned, so you do feel like you, you need to play more. Um, so what do you think gets lost? Like, obviously your life is sort of enveloped in chess. Um, but what gets lost when you're not competing regularly? Uh, I think to to put it simply, it's just like form. I think when you're playing often, uh, at least for me, if I'm doing like a lot of like training games over the board, it doesn't even have to be tournament games. But if I'm just doing some kind of 
um, playing, then I'm just like calculating throughout the game. I'm constantly checking, you know, for my opponent's threats because I know like any one mistake, it could just be like game over. So I have to be like very, very vigilant. And I think that kind of takes practice. You're not usually in such a like a do or die kind of mode if you're just playing online or if you're like solving a puzzle, like if you get it wrong, no big deal. During a game, like you can't really afford that. So you really have to like make sure you're calculating everything, you're checking all of the opponent's forcing moves, you're not missing. So it's like a lot of effort that you're putting in. And I feel like, yeah, if you're not doing that that often, yeah, you just get kind of rusty. I mean, for me, I definitely get rusty if I'm not playing for like even a couple of weeks. Yeah, the, the hardest thing is how unforgiving the game is of just like one slip up, you know, like that's kind of what happened to you in your last game. I mean, you had a nice comeback to get back into the game and then just poof, you know. Yeah, I essentially lost it in, in, in one move. It was honestly like unbelievable because like, it felt like a quiet end game. <laughs> like right. I, I thought maybe I'm worse. No, just like dead lost one move. Yeah. And of course, again, I found it very relatable and it's not like you hung a piece, but yeah, I mean, certainly in peak form, it was um, um, uh, something you, you would normally see. Um, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And you mentioned, so this podcast will come out after, I believe it was the, the Golden State open so you mentioned you have that coming up have you thought beyond so listeners will be able to check to see how that went do well first of all we should ask will you be doing video recaps for that one yeah i think i'm just gonna keep doing it <laughs> just from now on i mean people want to see the games uh, and it kind of motivates me to play more that people are interested in seeing the games that i'm forced to analyze the games i think that benefits me as well so yeah i think i'm just going to keep doing it that's great. Yeah. And I know you mentioned in one of the early rounds, you were a bit undecided um, about if you would like continue the effort of churning them out immediately after the game. Obviously, you know, time is very scarce in the middle of a tournament, as is energy. Um, so I certainly understood that that struggle. So have you decided yet what your approach will be uh, in that regard? Uh, yeah, I think I, I'll usually just play it by year. Like in Vegas, somehow... I didn't actually have too many long games. I think except for the final round, all my games were done before move 40. Um, and since the pairings weren't really going to be released um, until like an hour before the start of the next round anyway, I would just kind of have extra time as it was. So it kind of worked out. I could just record like a 20 minute video uh, and then it takes a little bit of time to upload. And so I wasn't losing a ton of time or energy. Um, but some events like you're playing for six hours and then your round is like, you know, in an hour. And then I would just skip that video. I would just do it later. Yeah, that makes sense. And one thing I was impressed with, because this is a um, North American Open is a continental chess tournament, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that means it's, uh, you know, the big sort of um, corporation that runs a lot of the tournaments here in the U.S. by Bill Goldsberg and uh, his affiliates. And my experience in, in the tournaments within the last year has been I'm seeing the pairings like 10 minutes before the round, but it seemed like you had some lead time because in your videos, you talked about preparation, uh, like looking up your opponent's lines a decent amount. So how you were getting the pairings like an hour in advance in these cases? Yeah, I'm not sure how it works for, um, let's say like the class sections, like the under 2100 and stuff, but like, or under 23 or whatever. But for the open section, um, we were getting them pretty consistently uh, like for the morning rounds when they ha they can do the pairings like overnight if they wanted to, but they they FIDA has these strict rules where if you like if you announce the pairings officially, then they're set in stone, and then if someone withdraws after that, you're not allowed to change them. So they do this thing where they only release the pairings like like an hour before the round. Um, but they were doing that pretty consistently, and then for the afternoon rounds when there's like a morning round that has to be finished, those are maybe I think a little bit slower like maybe 30 minutes before the round but they were generally pretty good for the open section i'm not sure why that is maybe it's like you get like less withdrawals or something or um i don't know but in the past i mean i've definitely played in a lot of their events where like the pairings come out five minutes after the round is supposed to start so right. i think maybe they're just kind of getting maybe getting better uh, at some tournaments or something that would be good. Um, yeah, something something to keep an eye on. And another thing I was curious about, Kostya, because you again you talked about your prep for these players a lot, um, is how you prepare now, especially like 
at your level, because for me now, if I do try to look someone up right before the rounds, I'm just going to Google them. I generally, especially again, given the time parameters, I don't really have to, even though I might have a laptop with a big database, uh, I'm generally not going to have time to take it out. Um, but I was curious how you balance someone's online games as compared to their tournament games in terms of uh, guessing what opening they might play. Um, yeah, it is kind of weird. Yeah, in the past, you just had their tournament games. You never had any online games. And now there's like thousands of games um, to look at. And then there was a period where you could look up someone's online games, but it was kind of assumed that everyone was just playing junk online. They were just playing random stuff and it wasn't really useful. But now there's like all these online events that are kind of serious and like Title Tuesday and people are like actually playing their full repertoires. So now it is kind of important to look at their online games. So um, if I have some, I'll just be fully honest, because why not? <laughs> if I have some idea of a player's repertoire, like I know like, okay, usually they're a Grunfeld player. Then if I see their online profile, and if I see they're playing a lot of Grunfeld, then I'll be like, okay, well, maybe they're they're playing their normal lines. But then if they're playing like a bunch of random openings, then I probably won't pay attention to it too much. If I know like, okay, usually they're only playing this one opening. Um, but some players like, you know, the, they just play their full repertoire uh, online, even actually like Andrew Tang, you know, Penguin Jam, like yeah. plays this like classical QGD and like hyper bullet bullet. Like it doesn't right. matter. He just plays the same stuff. It's still very hard to prepare from. Of course, he knows like a bunch of stuff, but yeah, some players, they just, they just do their, their normal thing. Okay. And if you don't know anything about a player, um, and let's say you have 15 minutes, are you going to fire up the laptop or are you just going to Google them and, and look at what's online? Yeah, I'll probably just Google them. I'll just search their name for like chess.com or like openingtree.com is a great resource. If you have like their uh, username, you can then like look up their games. Um, yeah, I just want to get like some idea. Like, you know, if I play D4, are they going to go D5 or like Knight of Six? Just like any info would be good. Or if they're playing white, are they like an E4 player, C4 player? You know, so I can just at least start thinking about what I want to do. But generally, okay, I feel like the correct approach is to just kind of be prepared against everything and you know, not really uh, have to uh, be too afraid of, of getting surprised in the opening. Yeah. And as I've mentioned in the past, like personally, at least I can find it. If I try to like fill my head with whatever variation I think might be coming, like if it's a very small amount of time, it, it can be counterproductive sometimes. So you, you got to be careful. Um, and so with you getting back in the sort of competitive frame of mind, Kostya, do you set like what any sort of goals, whether they be process or results oriented for like a, a year or any longer period of time? Yeah, the main kind of goal I'll set is like if I am wanting to like read a new book or something, I'll just tell myself like, OK, let's let's do like three, four examples a day or let's do like a chapter a day, just whatever is reasonable. And then um, then I just do that until I finish it or, uh, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm done with the book or something. Um, I definitely don't really set any rating goals because I feel like it's just kind of, you know, impossible to predict your performance. And I think not really helpful to like stress out about the rating too much. Uh, so, yeah, for me, it's always just kind of like process based goals. Good for you. And are there any books that you're trying to, to grind out right now? Yeah, there, there's a few. There's a few that I'm reading because I, I'm supposed to review them. And, and I'm also really, really interested in them. <laughs> I, I, can, I can relate. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> but um, uh, one book that I've really been meaning to get into is a new book by uh, Jan Marcos and, and David Navarra. I think yeah, um, quality yeah. chats. And just I read a little bit of it, and it's like super, super interesting. But yeah, it's really good. Time to, to yeah, that one. I, that one. Since I interviewed you on last year, I did manage to cram. But yeah, there's always the next interview coming. So as I said, between <laughs> that, between that and the book recaps, I can definitely relate. And definitely, I agree with what you said about uh, a little bit a day is the only way to go. Otherwise, it just uh, just becomes um, overwhelming. Um, yeah. And and Kostya, I, I think it came up in our last conversation. Um, I'm sure you get asked about it in Twitch and stuff all the time, but like the GM goal, is that something that like seriously animates you or is it like it, it would, be, you know, it would be nice. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I think uh, it is. It is a goal. It is a very specific goal. In fact, I had this goal when I was still a FIDE master and I realized like I, I'm pretty close to I am, you know, and I should just be thinking about like, I, I realize once I get to I am, I'm just going to want to get to GM anyway. So already back then, I was thinking like, man, what do I need to do to get to to GM strength? 
I mean, I think it's like a, it's like a life achievement, you know, it's really a nice thing. So um, I, I am really kind of hoping to, to get it. Now, definitely, I feel like my focus isn't on it 100% because I'm doing lots of stuff with like Dojo and, and, and YouTube. But um, it is like, yeah, if I could achieve like one thing for sure, I would say GM, that would be what, what I pick. Yeah. And um, I, I know, you, you know, Levy a little bit, you probably watched his uh, on again, off again, pursuit of the GM title. Uh, what what strikes you when you observe, uh, observe someone like Levy chase that title? Well, I, I sympathize that it's really hard to, to, to balance the, the two things, because it's like, the feeling is that to improve at chess, it, it only gets harder. And you have to do really hard work, like you have to solve problems that are difficult for you that like are really a struggle at first um and you might have to learn to play new positions that are like unfamiliar to you um like i felt like a big part of me going from like fm to im was like learning how to play the king's indian and the sicilian as black two openings that i never played before ever um and so but i felt like that growth was was very very helpful for my own understanding but it was very difficult i also had to solve like a, a ton of endgame studies that were like really challenging just like banging my my head against the wall but knowing that okay that's how that's the way to make progress and then feeling it and i can only imagine like it only gets harder right as you're going up the hill so i feel like it's only going to get harder to get from 2400 to, to 2500 uh and and so many like really really strong players uh struggle so yeah it feels really challenging to do unless you're just putting like your your full effort into it like eight hours a day studying like training for me also, it's always been like a mental thing. It's like, if I'm not specifically thinking about like tournaments all the time and what I'm doing to improve and how I'm training, I feel like I, I don't get that much better during those phases. But if you're like really, really focused on it, then I feel like that's when you, you make the most uh, improvement. And you often see it like when someone's just like totally obsessed with chess, they're just like doing it every single day. You can tell they're super motivated. And then they end up going up like two, three hundred points. Uh, and, and it's like not really a surprise <laughs> by the end of it, because I was like, yeah, they were just working super, super hard every single day. So it seems very hard to do that. Plus, and I think Levy probably does way more than I do in terms of like YouTube and streaming, like in terms of the hours he puts in, uh, at least what, what it feels like. So, yeah, it just seems imaginably difficult to, to balance the two. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so so hard i mean it's it's hard at my level to get better and as you say at you know trying to get the gm title it's got to be degrees like uh exponentially harder so i i can only imagine but selfishly it's i mean you know in your case like in lev in levy's case it's like as he's been vocal about it's the only reason he plays you know is to try to get the gm title whereas i feel like you might have a little healthier relationship with uh tournament chess but in any event it does make for for fun youtube viewing yeah yeah absolutely yeah i feel like if, if i play a lot and then you know my peak rating ends up being uh short of 2500 but i still feel like i improved from here yeah to me that's still that's still nice like i like the game i like playing i like learning new ideas and kind of seeing new positions uh, to me that's a very very rewarding feeling yeah. And what about the social aspect, Kostya? I mean, obviously the dojo has grown significantly. You've got a loyal following. So when you go to a place like Vegas, like how often are you getting to meet people that you interact with online and stuff like that? In in the past, it was basically never. But now, yeah, people have been uh, coming up to me and recognizing me, which has been very, very cool. But it hasn't been like overwhelming where I'm just getting swarmed with people, which is nice. Um, but yeah, it's great that like... Uh, we seem to have been helping a lot of people and that's been awesome. That was never the, the intention with uh, like, that was never the plan with Dojo. Like the, you know, it was started before the pandemic was like this huge thing, but then it ended up being like, Oh, everyone's like a little safe haven during, <laughs> during right, the pandemic, yeah. which is, which is very, very nice to see. Nice. Good. Good to hear. Yeah. And I'm sure it's a, it's a good feeling. Um, okay. Well, Costa, uh, of course, as we just mentioned, you're, a popular guy. So we've got a bunch of good Patreon sub questions related to chess improvement. So we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to dive into them. 
Perpetual Chess is proud, as always, to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Of course, Chessable is constantly dropping new courses. Some of their latest include Keep It Simple for Black by I am Christoph Selecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained. It gives an entire repertoire for black no matter what you face, and Christoph is always thorough yet not overloading you with variations. There is also a brand new Lifetime Repertoires Berlin Defense from former U.S. champion GM Sam Shanklin. I hate playing against the Berlin, so I'd rather you not get that one. But hey, if you're looking to learn it, of course, Sam Shanklin does not mess around with his course offerings. And of course, whatever you choose to study on Chessable, you can utilize their proprietary move trainer technology to help you remember the lines you learn. So be sure, as always, to go to chessable.com and take a look at what's new. And we are back. And Coach Chair, we've got a kind of evergreen question for you, uh, which actually, speaking of the aforementioned Levy Rosman, he just had a tweet today where he was kind of uh, casting aspersions at this, you know, the, the frequent question of like, uh, you know, I just discovered chess, I'm rated 800, what are my chances of becoming master, um, which uh, a lot, you know, in reading the replies, obviously it's going to be a wide range of feelings. Some people sort of, uh, applauding and other people kind of pushing back and saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with one wanting to, to better themselves. Um, it, it, there is something as has come up, uh, previously, of course, on, on the podcast, there is something unique about chess where the, the drive to, um, to improve is stronger than <laughs> in other adult hobbies. Um, so that's a long preamble for a similarly themed question from Jonathan Evans. So Jonathan, uh, thank you for supporting Perpetual Chess. And here is Jonathan's question. He says, uh, I'm about to turn 55. I still have hopes of getting a title, an MCM or FM. Um, do I, as a Class A player, do I have any realistic chance of earning one of these titles? And what separates a Class A player from a master? Yeah. So, um, well, well, great question. Yeah. I saw Levy's tweet. I thought that was so funny. <laughs> I, I definitely don't agree with like everything Levy says, but sometimes he, I think he really hits the mark. And on this one, you know, I liked the tweet. I, I did. Um, now Jonathan's question here, it sounds like he, uh, is around like 1800 judging from the question. And for me, it's like, okay, he's, it sounds like he's been playing for many years and I would say does have actual chances of getting the title from from 1800 and i i'd be happy to go into exactly what i think that would um entail um i would love to talk about the the levy tweet though for a bit just cause... yeah and actually i was just looking it up i i have it ready if you want me to uh to read it i think uh that might be helpful so that instead of uh paraphrasing we can pro quote him properly sure sure <laughs> So Levy said, chess is the only activity I know where noobs desperately want to become masters. It's insane. And then in quotes, what are my chances of becoming 2200 if I started at 27 and I'm 800? Can you chill the F out and just enjoy yourself? Unquote. <laughs> so sorry, as you were saying. <laughs> yeah, so like he obviously got a lot of pushback <laughs> for this because, <laughs> you know, people are like saying that he's like, you know, going after people for like setting goals and stuff. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that's exactly what he was doing. And uh, it should be said that as someone who's like a content creator and like a streamer, he probably gets that kind of question like all the time in his chat, yeah, probably, probably more times. than anyone in the world. <laughs> yeah, very, very possibly. Um, even in like our, our discord, you know, we get this form of question um, all the time and, and people have uh, different circumstances are like, oh, you know, I started chess when I was young, but then I haven't played since then. Like, can I still be good? And uh, there's so many different forms of essentially a very, very similar question. And it's really natural, I think, to ask this question, especially when you're like starting a new domain and you're trying to like figure out like what's happening there. Um, but yeah, long story short, it's just like, it's just a little uh, naive when someone just starts out and they're already thinking about like, how do I get a black belt, you know, in this? Um, because, uh, there's no typical path to get to like 2000, for example, right? There's like many players that have been playing for years and never touched 2000, never reached 1800. And, uh, maybe they worked like super, super hard, but it, it just never happened. So it's not like there's this like just straightforward way you can get to 2200, um, from anywhere. And so, uh, yeah, short answer is just like, it's just not that easy. And, yeah, I think it's like to go a little bit further. It's like, yeah, just relax. Just like try to enjoy the game and uh, figure out what interests you about it. 
And, and then that's what will actually like foster improvement once you get genuinely like curious about the game and you want to learn about all the different ideas and strategies and tactics and, uh, and, and so on. Um, but for people who have been playing, you know, for like several years, they, they kind of understand the struggle. They know how hard it is. Of course, it totally makes sense for them to make goals. Like if you're 1600 or something and you have a dream of reaching 2200, like I think that's like totally natural and, and, and healthy. I think it's good to have to me, I, ref I, I think of it more as like a dream, uh, like, you know, you have a dream of getting to 2200 and then your goal would be like maybe 1700, 1800. So something like a little bit more manageable would be what I suggest. But of course, people are allowed to set goals. But yeah, it's like when you're just starting out, it's like a little patience, I think, can go a long way in terms of um, shooting for the moon. Yeah, that's really a good point. There is this a common phenomenon and I'm not casting aspersions on anyone who, who feels this way. Um, where, as you say, you learn something new and you're like, Oh, I want to get really good at it. You know? And then in, in chess, that happens to be very, uh, very generally correctly measured with the rating system. So, um, the, there is sort of this, this baptism by fire where eventually everyone sort of learns about the the true the true path in front of them but but as you say uh there's nothing wrong with goals i mean we were just talking about it uh you know in, in your case um in levy's case i want to get my uscf rating back to 2200 like everyone has goals um so very well said now as to jonathan's specific question so what what do you think what does what are the primary differentiators between 1800 and 2200 and uh what is the realistic chance someone could could bridge that gap so yeah i definitely think it would be a very tough road ahead and um it it does seem like as you get older it's like just forgetting the the biological stuff it's just like you don't have a lot of time in many cases to work on chess and i think that's kind of uh, often the the big issue that prevents someone from being able to just put a lot of hours in and, and do the work. But uh, if I imagine just like, let's say a typical 2200, forgetting age and everything like that uh, versus a typical 1800, um, I would imagine that the the master is like, okay, he's going to know like a few, few more moves of opening theory on average. Maybe he's going to know some lines like really well compared to the 1800 player. Um, and I think they're going to know a lot more uh, middle game ideas and be able to kind of recognize them uh, a lot faster. Um, like if I if I show like some typical Sicilian position where you know the best move is rook take c3 exchange sacrifice. I think like your average twenty two hundred probably sees that very very quickly, like maybe under thirty seconds. If you show that same position to like an average eighteen hundred, you know it might take them three four five minutes to to find the same idea. So they might even seen a lot of like the same themes and, and motifs, but the 2200 probably just recognizes a lot of like middle game structures, themes, ideas uh, a lot faster and probably just has like a broader uh, knowledge. Um, and then, of course, I think calculation is, is going to be maybe maybe even the biggest uh, the biggest factor. If you take like what an 1800 calculates during a game or like in one position and compare it to like a master, it might be like you know, a third of the moves calculated, a fourth of the moves, you know, I'm not really sure. It'd be interesting to kind of measure that. But uh, I, I would think that the 2200 is probably seeing uh, a lot more during the game in terms of tactics and the amount they're able to calculate. So my focus would be uh, to definitely work on calculation. Um, if nothing else, if you have good calculation, you spot a winning tactic, you can you can upset a lot of players that way. Um, and uh, definitely to work on like middle game, understanding middle game um, ideas. Because uh, they're actually, you know, there's some older players on the circuit and they're like maybe, you know, 21, 2200 uh, in terms of their rating or maybe even like 2000, but they're very, very hard to beat because like they've just been playing chess for a while and they've been playing their structures forever and they know the middle games really well. Even if you just get like a uh, plus one position out of the opening, they're still really difficult to outplay because they just kind of know their structures and their ideas and they're familiar with the plans. And so I think that would be kind of what I, what I would strive for. Yeah. Good advice. And just one other thing I would add for Jonathan, since he mentioned that he's 55 and I'm 44. So at least uh, closer to Jonathan than, than Kostya is, is as you get older, when you play tournaments, you just have to be so mindful of managing your energy. Um, so that becomes like its own skill set apart from all of the actual chess issues is like you you start to have to think about like 
taking buys here and there, maybe a strategic draw here and there. But here in the U.S., at least, you just you have to be mindful of uh, just what a disadvantage you might be at if you're in like the 10th hour of play against like an, an 18 year old kid. Um, so sad truths. But uh, but definitely, Kostya, I, I I enjoy your overall advice. Um, definitely echo it. And uh, especially about like, you know, some sort of intermediate goal might be beneficial. Like it sounds like, uh, like, um, perhaps focus on expert first, Jonathan. And then if you get there onto the, the dream goal of master slash candidate master. Oh yeah. Definitely step by step would be the way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, um, Along a similar vein or slightly similar vein, we have a question from longtime supporter of the pod, Tyron Ross Price. Excuse me. Shout out to Tyron. And he asks, he says, many chess coaches seem to specialize in scholastic players. Where to find coaches for vintage passers in air quotes like me, age 60 plus, 1700 to 1800 USCF, but still wanting to improve? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I actually definitely don't mind working with adults in general. I feel like adult players, like they come motivated on their own and they often, you know, like are ready to to do some stuff. You know, they just kind of want to be told what to do in most cases and then they they go do it. And yeah, I think in general, actually very easy to work with adult players. But um, I think you can find, uh, I feel like most coaches wouldn't discriminate actually. So I feel like you could find, you know, you can ask on Twitter and just be like, hey, I'm looking for a coach. I'm sure you'll get lots of suggestions, but, um, chess.com has like a, a coaches, uh, listing. Lee chess has one as well. I think Lee chess.org slash coaches or something like that. Um, and yeah, there's lots and lots of listings there. Um, in the, in the discord, we have like a couple coaches and yeah, I don't think they care at all. Uh, the age of the player, if anything, it seems like they prefer the adult improvers. Cause they're like, you know, the most like motivated, they're always like gung ho and, you know, ready to like, uh, train. Yeah, and it, it's often just more fun to to talk to adults. Um, one other point I would add that I've mentioned before is I, I don't think people, you know, uh, potential students should feel bad about just trying out a coach. You know, as someone who's done some coaching myself, like if someone gets one lesson or gets a few lessons and then drops off, like I don't mind at all. You know, like mm -hmm. that's just that's just kind of the way the world works. Um, you know, people's interest in chess waxes and wanes. Um, it's important to have a personal uh, fit. So like Coach just said, just you can either network online, Tyron, or try out these uh, these coaches things, but you don't necessarily need to feel like it's like some big commitment to try a lesson with someone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Unless, Coach, you get super offended if someone does one lesson with you and, uh, <laughs> and drops it. <laughs> no, for me, it's like if, if they're interested, then I'm happy. But if they're not interested, then then yeah, I would rather not not do the lesson either. I mean, yeah, they're just not that into you. Good relationship, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we've got a uh, one more improvement related question. This one's from Aryan Duvapov, and he asks. He says. Kostya, I really like your one your Endgame 101 course. I'm amazed by the quality and the positions. They're really fun to solve. On the forums, you said you will likely make more courses in the future. Do you have any ideas or hints about the subjects or directions? Please don't let it be an opening course, but rather about tactics or strategy or endgames. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks for the, the question. Well, um, I, I think I will make uh, an Endgames 201 course. Oh, nice. Um, and, and get into some some harder uh, studies and stuff. Yeah, because I, I have a ton of material left over. There was a bunch of studies that were, you know, like, you know, too challenging or too tricky for the course, but maybe like the next step up. Um, and it would be interesting to try to kind of like bridge that gap a little more between like total beginner, never solved an endgame study before to like now having solved some, but, you know, ready to get into like the really uh, tough stuff. I have thought about other courses as well. Um, I really wanted to make a course on like E4 middle games and uh, just kind of showing like model games um, in like the Rui Lopez, Sicilian, just like really, really typical plans, uh, this kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's kind of uh, been on the back burner for a while. So I'm not sure I might get to it in the future because I feel like it it's a thing that needs to exist <laughs> and I want to get it out there at some point. But um, yeah, those are the only courses I've really, I've really thought about. 
Yeah. Well, as I mentioned in our uh, How to Chess interview, and listeners should definitely check that out, in, in which I mentioned I'm super impressed with uh, Endgame Studies 101. And also just more generally, especially as you say, your ability to to find a way to make it bite-sized because it's been, an as, as we talked about on How to Chess, it's been like an ongoing theme in perpetual chess where like every strong player or many strong players say do Endgame Studies, do Endgame Studies, do Endgame Studies. But anyone rated like below 1900 can't find any that are solvable, you know? So I, I, I think it's quite useful that you bridge that gap. And yeah, I would definitely look forward to uh, similar, similar uh, chessable courses in the future. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. And so Kostya, with the chess dojo, I, we've got a couple questions relating to the business of chess dojo that I want to get into, but I'm curious, um, you know, as I've talked to you about in the past, I'm just not a Discord person. It just disorients me. Uh, <laughs> so I, I uh, even though I love Dojo and I watch some of your videos, I don't really participate in, in much Discord. I'm curious, wh what's the day-to-day -day like in there? What sort of questions are you guys answering? What's, what's going on in there amongst uh, the loyal Dojo members? Mm, and so actually, we should probably start with explaining what a Discord is for, for other old <laughs> men like me. Yeah, basically, Discord is a, an app. Um, you can, yeah, you can access it on your browser. Uh, but I think most people use uh, like a mobile version or or a desktop. Um, basically, it's a great app for communities, um, and there are lots of different like uh, chess communities and like uh, all kinds of stuff, like video game communities. You know, anything you can you can imagine, poker, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, Discord is just like. I always felt was um, kind of underutilized in the chess world, uh, at least in in the past. So Dojo, as it as it stands now, was formed in March 2020 with I am David Pruis and and Grandmaster uh, Jesse Cry, and uh, you know we kind of like have this culture of like it being all about self improvement and and so on. Um, but originally it was just this like Discord server. Because uh, I felt like there should be a place for people to kind of gather and like talk chess, try to find uh, training partners. Because at the time, the only thing that really was around was like the the chess subreddit, which is just like very disorganized and it's just kind of the same questions being asked over and over again. And then chess Twitter, which again, like very hard to to find stuff there. So th it felt like there wasn't any kind of centralized place where someone was just like interested in getting some training games or like finding a training partner, they can go and, and, and connect with people. Um, so uh, that was kind of like its uh, original purpose. And then um, a few months later, this was like December 2019, um, uh, I got in touch with like David and, and Jesse, and, and they were looking to maybe start streaming again. And we decided it'd be a good idea to team up. And um, we weren't even going to use Dojo at first, but then I was like, I already, the name was already there. <laughs> it was like the Discord server was formed, the Twitch channel was there. So it was all kind of like set up. And so we ended up just kind of like co-opting it together and, and making it um, our own thing. And now it's really, it's really blown up. And now it's truly like an amazing uh, community because we have people like all over the world. A lot of them are like OTB players. A lot of them are just like pure online players. And um, we have like different channels where people can discuss like openings, middle games, end games. They can like post a game they just played. Um, generally, there's a lot of discussion on like chess news. So if something happens or like, you know, someone uh, tweets something or Fide does something, there'll, there'll be a lot of discussion. Um, and, uh, and then of course, tons of discussions uh, on the typical like chess punks topics, like how to improve, what's the best ways to get better, like tactics, um, you know, if, if I'm 32 years old, can I still get good? Like <laughs> this kind of thing. Um, that happens uh, uh, pretty, pretty often. But it's mainly the community, actually. Every once in a while, I'll jump in and and voice some some takes. But um, I mainly leave it up to, to folks to kind of uh, talk it out. Nice. Yeah, it's, I was listening to our last interview um, in, in preparation for this one, which was in 2019, not counting our How to Chess interview. And uh, it was amazing that how to that uh chess dojo didn't even exist you know like it feels to me like it's it feels to me like such a sort of stalwart of the like online chess you know community and meanwhile like it wasn't even there yet so so congrats on uh on the quick growth that's great to hear well you too ben i remember when you first started your podcast you just like I didn't even know who you were. You just sent out a tweet like, hey, I'm going to do a chess podcast. Does anyone want to like get interviewed? 
<laughs> yeah, and you were guest number four, the, the first guest that like I, I wasn't already recorded when the podcast launched. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so yeah, I just thought it was such a cool project. And now, uh, I mean, now I'd say you have like the biggest chess show like in the world, maybe. I mean, like, like everyone knows perpetual chess. Thank you. Yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> hope, let's hope we can keep it that way. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Well, I've got more dojo related questions, Kostya, but we're going to take uh, take another break and then we'll we'll get to them. Listeners, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The bad news is I'm still stuck at being behind on the clock in 77% of my Blitz games, neither getting better nor worse, just spinning my wheels endlessly. The good news is, unlike me, Aim Chess has managed to improve its product even more. They've totally redesigned the interface of aimchess.com. They've added the ability to use Aim Chess even if you don't have a linked account on chess.com, Lee Chess, or Chess24. They've expanded payment options to include Google Pay and Apple Pay. So doing everything they can to make Aim Chess even more user-friendly and fun, accessible, and educational. So if you haven't already, be sure to check out aimchess.com. And as always, use the code PERPETUAL30 to receive a 30% discount if you decide to subscribe. And we are back, and we've got a question from a recent guest host of the podcast, friend of the pod, Chris Wainscott, who wrote in to ask you, Kostya, how you balance your time spent on income generating projects such as the dojo versus time needed to improve and go after the GM title? Yeah, yeah, tough question. Um, and, and shout out to Chris. Well, uh, for me, like I mentioned, it's really, really tough. So I don't even know if I'm I'm doing it right at all. But what I kind of have in mind is I often just have like one focus um, at a, a time. So if I like have a tournament coming up, then I'll try to focus on the event and I'll kind of dial down the amount of uh, non training work that, that I'm doing. Um, but sometimes like, especially during the pandemic, it felt like, you know, I wasn't going to play for another three to six months or something. And, uh, and then I just, okay, I, I don't pretend that I'm trying to get better at chess. I just kind of focus on the, the dojo. And, and when I was working on the course, I was working a lot just on the course itself. Um, and yeah, I just kind of focus on the, the income work and I don't do a lot of like training on my own, but then once I have a tournament coming up, I kind of, you know, switch, switch back to incorporating more studying. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And in terms of the, the income, if you, I don't know how many details you want to get into, but, um, like how big a part is YouTube as opposed to Twitch streaming, as opposed to sort of all the, the the coaching that you guys do as a result of, well, I mean, you guys would be in demand as coaches anyway, but I'm just curious um, because I'm always impressed with how many hours uh, you, David and Jesse are putting in. Yeah. Um, well, to put it lightly, I would say that the dojo revenue stream. So like we have a Twitch, a Patreon, um, a YouTube. Um, we get a little bit when someone clicks one of our Amazon links a very um, little bit, I can say from experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not much, but you know it adds up. So I, we appreciate that that people do it. Um, so all that, it, you know, I think I think David tried to do a calculation and he came up with something that was like slightly less than minimum wage um, for because there's a three of us and we also have a, a graphics guy and an editor guy, uh, DM Hokey, who is actually just a full partner. So it's really the four of us that are, are sharing everything, um, and. Um, so yeah, I would say the dojo is still more in a, of an investment and we're just doing it mainly because we in, enjoy the project. Um, but we all, I think, have uh, income streams uh, other than that, like from private coaching and, and stuff like that. Um, for me personally, I was uh, mainly making most of my income from coaching and I've slowly been kind of dialing it down and spending more time on kind of like broader projects. Um, so I guess in the short term, maybe like not making as much uh, as I could be if I was like coaching full time, but I kind of see it as like a long term investment into the future because I do really love what the dojo has become. And I feel like it's such a cool um, uh, project now that it, it's totally been worth it. Glad to hear. Yeah. And well worth support for anyone who's in, in a position to do so. And obviously, if you're utilizing it, I mean, I'm sure, Costa, you don't mind if people support you, even if they don't know, know what Chess Dojo is. But but <laughs> more right. more uh, traditionally, it's someone who's a, a fan of your work, as I am, and uh, and 
yeah, wants to make sure you guys can uh, can keep it going because you are devoting um, so much time to it. Um, and related question from Michael Rosenberg, uh, who asks, he says, uh, thanks for your, the work you provide to Chess Dojo and for your chess book course. And with the growth of the dojo, what content would you like to see that is missing, if anything? Um, yeah, it's, it's a funny question because it's like, it's a question for, um, well, it's a question that I would be asking of myself because I'm <laughs> one of the main producers of, of the content. Um, but uh, yeah, actually related to the income question, uh, we recently launched um, a site uh, that is uh, designed to ha kind of sell like courses and also some some merchandise, which is uh, chessdojo.shop. So a uh, pretty simple name. And uh, right now we're actually working on putting up some of our, our own courses. Um, and our idea with this um, is mainly that it's not that YouTube is like, um, you know, it's obviously not a not a great income stream, but also I feel like when something is put on YouTube, it like just doesn't get taken quite as seriously as if when you like release like a course, like here are my teachings. This is like how I think you should like learn this topic or get better. So it feels like the course, if anything, gets taken more seriously. Um, but yeah, that's something that we're working on as well. Um, I also have just a million ideas for YouTube itself, like a bunch of videos that I think uh, need to get made and, and get out there because I think people are still, for the most part, very confused about chess improvement, especially a lot of like the new players, you know, that are like just gotten into chess, like the last year, two years, three years. And they're just like uncovering how much there is <laughs> in the chess world. I feel like, uh, yeah, there's a lot more, um, a lot more that could be made in terms of like guides, like uh, training plans, study plans, like here's what to work on. Here's how to learn this topic or get better at this. Um, so there is a ton of content I also want to do just for uh, our YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, actually for the uh, the dojo itself, uh, last year we ran a very quick, uh, David just like did the, did the whole thing, uh, club championship where we had like a qualifier event and then we had these like cool knockout matches between the members um, for 2022. I'm really excited about the idea of we're going to just like the whole year long is going to be like a one year long qualifier thing for the championship um, at the end. So we'll be like a lot more involved and then it's going to end with like this like awesome championship between the members, which usually just like a lot of fun. And it's a lot of fun to watch and uh, yeah, just like great for, the community overall. So I definitely want to run a lot more uh, tournaments and like league events and like this kind of thing. That's fun. And and we should ask, how does one become a member? Oh, it's, it's very simple. You you got to uh, sign up for Discord and, and you can join. It's open to everyone. Um, within the Discord, we have like different roles. So like if you're uh, like an OTB player, you have some kind of OTB title, like a uh, candidate master, FIDE master. We have like roles for that. Um, we also have roles for like online players. So you can like link up your chess.com account, your Lee chess account, um, and then it'll track your ratings and then assign roles um, based on that, which is which is pretty cool. Um, and then, yeah, all the info is in the Discord. It can be a little hard, uh, I'm sure, to get used to it. But in general, people are very uh, friendly and uh, newbies can always ask questions. We have a questions channel where it's like anything goes. You can ask about, you know, any, no question is to beginner. Um, and so people are usually willing uh, to help out if, if something's unclear. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of events that you can join through the Discord. Like we're doing a classical tournament where you play like one game a week. You get your uh, opponent ahead of time and then you guys just like schedule a game together. Um, and then, yeah, we're also trying to run like a bunch of different uh, rapid events as well. But basically just join the Discord, join the Discord, join the Twitch. That's it. And and then you have the like the running contest too. The name escapes me, but T Ty Pru Zimmerman's in it. Like uh, you know, uh, chess by the numbers. Like uh, is it called oh, Ultimate, Ultimate Sensei? Sensei? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so what's the latest with Ultimate Sensei? Um. So yeah, Ultimate Sensei. We are in the middle of season two. For anyone not familiar with the show, this is the second season. Um. It's basically like the chess version of um, The Ultimate Fighter, if anyone uh, remembers that show. It's also maybe like, a, you can think of it as like a more serious version of Pog Champs, um, where basically we we invited four coaches. I'm one of the coaches on uh, this season. Uh, David won the inaugural season. Um, we also have, uh, I am Andres Toth in uh, this year, Matt Kolosowski and uh, another streamer. 
um, uh, her name is slow down, but it's a woman's GM, Sasha uh, Oblensen Teva. Uh, I'm sure I, I totally butchered that. But um, each of the coaches, they get two students to work with. This season, all the students have been in the uh, 14 to 1600 range. And then uh, the idea is just to see who can improve the most uh, over the course of about two months. So we end with like this big finale. Uh, we've each been like training our students uh, throughout the season. Uh, they've also been like doing these like challenges, like a tactics challenge, an end game challenge. Uh, that's been pretty fun. It's all been kind of streamed. And so the, the content is like on Twitch and, and YouTube. Um, and yeah, and then it's going to end with like a big knockout final where, uh, you know, eventually one of the teams will win like a coach and two students. Yeah, it's it's a great idea. And I know the students get get super excited, both get in some cases more exposure and also get some some free chess lessons. So definitely, uh, definitely a fun project um, for for people to check out. And um, Kostya, hearing you talk about all, all of the interactions in uh, in um, in the chess dojo discord and sort of uh, you mentioned uh, people sometimes um, having sort of uh, unrealistic expectations in the beginning and you wanting to help with that. So I'm curious, like, what do you consider your most, your most dispensed chess advice? What do you find yourself repeating more than any other thing? Oh, great question. Cause I, yeah, I'd love to just get it all out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, generally we are, are telling people, and it's not just me, it's just like David and Jesse, they also kind of feel these questions very frequently. We're usually just telling people to play more uh, classical chess um, and I've honestly found, you know, people have developed all kinds of habits that back in the day, it just like, wasn't even a concern. But nowadays I've noticed like, you know, people will play on their phone. People will play while they're like watching a video or like doing something like totally distracted. Um, and then of course you do worse when you play while you're distracted, but it's like, it's kind of common for a lot of people. So they don't, <laughs> they don't, they don't realize it, but, um, yeah, I'm often telling people like, you got to focus during the game. You got to try to play longer time controls. Um, so like at least rapid, but maybe classical, um, you got to try to develop that like kind of deeper side of the game where you're actually thinking about um, your moves. I think the, the biggest thing I would love to communicate is that like, you know, everyone plays a ton of blitz, but blitz I've always felt like is great for uh, testing your your instincts and like, you know, kind of your your quick responses in chess. But if you haven't been playing for a very long time, you haven't really had a chance to develop those instincts yet. It's only after like years and years of like tournaments and postmortems and analysis that like these thematic ideas, you know, that's why they, they come up so quickly. Um, so I feel like a lot of players get into the game and then they jump into blitz games and they like hang everything. They're like, oh, I'm so terrible. Like I can't do this at all. But like, that's how it is for, for everybody. Like when I was a kid, like, I don't think I could play blitz at all. <laughs> like, I, think, I think I was just like a terrible player for like many, many years. So yeah. And I'm old enough. You're probably younger, but you know, I've told stories in the past, like as a 44 year old, and I'm sure Jesse has serious, um, similar stories. Um, they're, they're like blitz was just less of a thing. I mean, as you got stronger, say when you hit 16 to 1800 and you start to play a lot of tournaments, like you're going to be playing blitz with friends when you see them. But since there was no online, there was like no chance to waste your life playing blitz like <laughs> through, through the development curve. Whereas now it's like this tantalizing and not even touching the topic of bullet, which is obviously uh, blitz, you know, on crack blitz accelerated. Um, right. Yeah. It's like this temptress that, that didn't exist in prior ages, but now, uh, now people do, I agree, need to be, uh, be judicious in their use of. Yeah. And th there are like, there can be benefits to Blitz. And, you know, if you play a bunch of Blitz games, then you like analyze each one really carefully and, and try to take something away from it. I think that could be super, super helpful, but that doesn't really seem to be the way most people are doing it. It seems like they just play a lot and they don't really look at the games afterwards. And especially if they like lose a bunch of games, they just say like, ah, forget about it. You know, they just like leave it alone and then never, you know, they just kind of end up repeating uh, the same mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And any other advice that you find yourself dispensing all the time? I mean, I know you've got lots of videos on book recommendations and stuff like that, and we we kind of always check in on it. I guess um, I could ask if you have any any new recommendations from the past couple years. Oh man, there <laughs> there have been a lot of uh, a lot of great books. Um, I would actually just suggest folks to check out um, like the YouTube for our our book reviews because we we have 
quite a few there. Um, and we also have a page on our Patreon that I should probably update with like um, all of my recommendations. That one's just like open to the public. Uh, it's not behind a paywall, but it just has all my uh, recommendations. Um, and I'm planning a couple of videos where I want to do a lot more um, like book recommendations for like strategy, tactics, and and so on. Um, in terms of the advice question, what else have uh, I feel like people ask all the time? Um, yeah, people always ask about openings. They're like, is this opening okay for this rating? Like is Accelerated <laughs> Dragon okay for 1200 or, or so and so? And the answer is always just like, it's all playable. It's all fine. As long as it's like a real opening and not like uh, bong cloud like you can pretty much play it uh, up until any level and uh, and really it's more important thing it's like it's not that there's just good and bad openings it's like there's openings that work for you and openings that maybe don't suit your style you should just try different stuff until you find something that you like and then you can definitely play it at any level and up until pretty much any point um, so yeah I think people are really maybe putting a little bit too much emphasis of course on which openings they're playing yeah, and any sort of deep dive on whether it be like an aim chess or a chess.com sort of insights algorithm is going to reveal that, you know, that, that like whether you got 0.3 or 0.2 as white is not what's uh, determining the outcome of, uh, of your game, although certainly uh, knowing, knowing the structures can help. And uh, circling back to what you were saying about YouTube, Kostya, that jogged my memory. Am I correct that you're your top four most overrated chess books is that your most is that your most viewed youtube video i th i think so on my on my personal on channel, personal I, channel yeah. I think it probably outdoes the dojo as well yeah yeah it's, it's got the listicle format and you 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 know you fire some shots <laughs> so um so when when something like that happens do you uh do you get the the urge to like lead into that where you're just like all right i'm gonna do like 10 more listicles and talk trash about a bunch more books or how do you like uh maintain your purity right you definitely yeah, you definitely do get that <laughs> temptation um it also is i think just a quirk of youtube because it seems like what youtube does is if you have one um clear number one video, then as soon as your channel gets any traction, it'll start just pumping that video out first to a lot of people. So it ends up just really just taking up um, all the initial views. Um, yeah, definitely, you know, it's like the the urge for, for clickbait is there. And we have played around with it a bit on Dojo, especially uh, I think Jesse is a big fan of having like shocking thumbnails and, <laughs> and so what uh, clickbait titles. But I feel like deep down, you know, you just have to you have to be like honest to what you really believe and you have to communicate truthfully. And I think, I think that's what people really connected with in the videos because well, everyone knows Bobby Fisher teaches chess is not, a, not that good of a book. Um, and for the other books I mentioned, it's like, they were kind of just like overblown. They're still actually very good books. The ones uh, I listed, but um, they're just like, yeah, I mean, I remember know, my so system was one of them. What do you remember? What the other the other two were? Yeah, it was um, it was my system, which is of course very hyped up and I think is interesting, you know, historically, but like not the most useful book right now. Um, it was Silman's How to Reassess Your Chess, which I think is a great book, by the way, and I often recommend that book. I just don't think it's like if you go to some some places on the chess internet, it's like that's the only book you're supposed to read on strategy, which I think is a little bit too much because uh, there's lots of other great strategy books. And then the last one was Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual, um, which again, amazing book actually. And I think one of, I think I ranked it as one of like the top 10 best books of all time. <laughs> but, but it's often recommended to people that uh, would, I think, do much better with like an easier Endgame book. And it's like so unnecessarily complicated. Um, and uh, yeah, honestly, I think that was the reason I made the video. I was just really tired of seeing that book getting recommended to like, 1400s and and totally uh genuinely too not in like a nefarious way but um yeah it's like and if you just like google like best endgame books it usually comes up first and so i just felt like it's going to be very confusing like you just started out people are telling you you got to study your end games you pick up devretsky's endgame manual like you're going to really struggle with that and that's yeah for not sure a place to start yeah. And just something to add on how to reassess your chest, because that was one of the first book recap podcasts I did um, with uh, Todd Kennedy. And uh, we were pretty positive about it. But as I've done now, I'm up to 22 book recap 
pods or whatever. My thinking has evolved a little about it too. Like you, I still say it's a good book and I get why people love Silman, but as I've reflected on it more, to me, it's it's a it's information overload is what I would say about mm. it. I, I find that for, for players in sort of, I mean, I can learn from that book. I mean, it's it covers a wide range of uh, of themes and I think someone from say, you know, 1500 to 2200 can can learn from it, but it's so vast in scope that I think it might be a bit counterproductive. So that's why I've sort of gravitated towards uh, books like Winning Chess Strategies and uh, Simple Chess um, as higher recommendations, even though they're all worthwhile. And as I've repeated many times, I, I think, and you've said this, you've, you've, uh, that's another thing I want you to riff on. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, serve that up for you in a second. But anyway, um, what I was going to say is, uh, what you study is less important. And what I want you to riff on is all the chess books you need have already been written, uh, which I believe was, a, uh, uh, you said in a memorable clip. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it, it's all been out there, right. For, for some time. Um, yeah, I think about this all the time. Like how many grandmasters were made before computers, before the internet, just like from analyzing chess positions and, and getting better this way. But, um, yeah, okay. I mean, chess books have been around forever and they're kind of just like the the tried and, and true method um, uh, of improving. I mean, I think most players like, you know, around like 2200 or so, it's not like they've only read one strategy book in their lives. They probably read multiple. They probably read Silman and like maybe some Sharashevsky, maybe some, uh, you know, uh, other authors at some point. So um, yeah, I think all the material has definitely already been been written so you don't need like this like new thing next thing um with the exception to be perfectly honest of the end game studies course that i don't yeah. think existed <laughs> <laughs> indispensable yeah <laughs> yeah and anything else you know the the you or or if i ever release anything it all, will also be indispensable but but yeah i mean obviously i end up recommending tons of books on here we have different sponsors who i you know i firmly believe in but and as i've mentioned before i'm you know I'm uh, I'm no different than anyone else. I, you know, independent of all the the reading I do sort of uh, work related for the podcast, when a new book comes out, I want to buy it, you know, and and really it's um, it's really about uh, the biggest thing I could do is eliminate distractions uh, rather than just like bring more inputs in. But but that's uh, that's the life we've chosen. Right, Costa? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, to to slightly counter, you know, my own point, the the rate of improvement, it does seem like has gone in way faster in the last like couple decades. Now we have like just so many juniors coming out of pretty much anywhere um, that ha have access to like internet, have access to computers. And because of that, like chess has really kind of exploded uh, all over the world. Um, so it is possible that there could just be some like more efficient ways of getting better. Uh, and I imagine a future in like a hundred years where it's just like, you know, the way people study chess is they just do chessable and they just go through like 10,000 of the most common, like tactical middle game, end game patterns, whatever. And like, that's just how people train. And then that's what the game becomes, which is a little bit scary, but like, <laughs> could, could end yeah. up there. Um, but uh, yeah, I feel like um, for now, it's like, we still have a little bit of wisdom. I think the chess coaches do about how chess improvement is made. Good, good stuff, Kostya. And the last thing I wanted to ask you about is like in, in the Wayback Machine in our uh, interview in, I guess it was probably 2016, interview number four, whenever it was, you talked about sort of an interest in improv comedy when you were younger, but we haven't chatted that much about, I mean, you did tweet, I think it was a tweet that like you were getting to spend a night out with your girlfriend in Vegas, but like what else outside of this life full of chess are, are you into these days, Kostya? Oh, interesting. Yeah. It, to be honest, I don't do a whole lot, uh, especially since the uh, the pandemic has started. But um, I'm into I'm into crypto. I'm excited to see where we're going. Oh, really? You going. managed to keep it very. I mean, other than the Doge O thing on Twitter for a while, the, the <laughs> related to Dogecoin, you you're not like a sort of strident crypto bro online. Well, it's because I I don't really know that much uh, about it, and so I don't want to be like one of these. Like I honestly, I understand very little, you know, about the the deeper nature. I just find it fascinating. I just find the whole thing interesting. So I'm just interested in it. I don't have any opinions or takes on it. I just don't know enough. Um, so yeah, I try to try to like 
keep my mouth shut on things I don't know too much about. And even on the things I do know something about, I'm trying to like <laughs> taper it down <laughs> for the most part. Uh, but uh, I'm into crypto. And then maybe the only other thing I spend time on is this video game uh, called Overwatch that I just find very fun. Um, my girlfriend got me into it. She played a little bit before and now we play uh, together quite often. And uh, yeah, it's kind of like a, you know, like a shooter, like a Counter-Strike, but with a little bit more uh, strategy, a little bit. Uh, it's not just like just shooting at people. So it's kind of fun. Cool. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty it. popular, right? Uh, oh, yeah. A, a lot of chess players are, are into it uh, as well, from what, what I know. Okay. Yeah, and then Kasparov's been getting into some video game, right? Do you do you remember which which one? Yeah, he did some ad with like like League of Legends or something, one of the big uh, esports games. That was shocking. That was not something I ever expected <laughs> to yeah, see. Yeah, surprising to see. Um, cool. And you you still live in the Bay Area, right, Kostya? That's right. Yeah. And you're you're staying there for the foreseeable future. Um, I, for now. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I do. I still like, uh, California for sure. Yeah. N nice, nice state for sure. Um, cool. All right. Well, Kostya, this has been great to catch up. It was overdue, um, to have a long form conversation. Uh, anything to add before we wrap up? No, thank, thanks for having me, Ben. This was, uh, really a ton of fun. Yeah, always fun to, to chat. And yeah, just can't say enough as I do uh, almost every week, say enough kind words about all the uh, all the work that you, Jesse and David are doing for the Chess Dojo. So uh, listeners will put put all the links of anything we've referenced in, in the show notes as always. And uh, and Kostya, I will, uh, I will catch you online. Thanks, man. Much appreciated. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.